Good morning. Please bow your heads as we pray now. Lord, we thank you for this day, this beautiful day which you have made, and we were rejoicing in it. We rejoice that although it's a beautiful day, we also have the great blessing of coming to you in prayer and coming to you to worship freely. Lord, we pray now for your word. We pray now for this message. May you speak through me and to me and to all of us as we open up our minds to hear what you have for us now. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Well, yesterday at men's breakfast, I was reminded of a story which I'd like to start this morning with sharing with you. I would also like to encourage all the men and all the boys in this room and watching online to to feel free to join us each month, the second Saturday of the month for men's breakfast. It's free. It's great food. It's great fellowship with one another. And for this summer... We've actually been doing a summer of hobbies, and we've been getting to learn about different people's hobbies at the same time as getting a devotion and replenishment, a meal, food, excuse me, lost my breath there. Dwayne Shoebridge, I thank you for putting this together and giving leadership to this. And Sam Follendorf, I thank you for yesterday teaching us men how to tie spinners for walleye. Yesterday, we had a boat show, and a couple of us brought in boats, and we shared boating stories and fishing stories. And as we were sitting there sharing these stories, hearing people's stories, one story came to mind, which I wanted to save for today, obviously, about boating. It starts like this. One day in a state far away, Yes, a Star Wars reference in a land far, far away. I was a young 8 to 10-year-old boy out fishing with my dad when a storm came upon us. Now, you know how it goes when you're having fun. You don't want to stop. You don't want to give up. You don't want to leave. So we kept fishing. Although we saw these dark clouds on the horizon, we just kept hoping, kept praying that this storm would just go around us or that it would not let loose over top of us. But... But of course, you know what happens. We're making memories, and all of a sudden, this storm just lets loose. The wind starts a-howling. The waves start developing. The white caps and the rain starts pouring down on us, and it did not start slow. It did not start soft. It was dumping the rain upon us, and the waves were crashing against this boat we were in. You see, we had a small aluminum 14-foot Sears Super Game Fisher boat with only a 15-horsepower outboard motor. And let me tell you, this boat was not designed for these big waves, for whitecaps, for storms. My dad started back for the boat ramp while I was at the bow trying to hold it down as if my little 8 to 10-year-old 80-pound body could hold anything down or affect anything against this storm. I wasn't designed to be in this storm alone either. We all need help. But across the lake we would go, probably slower than one could be running beside the boat, running on land. We're getting bounced around by the waves. We're feeling like we're going to die. We're feeling like we're going to sink like the Edmund Fitzgerald. Now, to be honest... I was young, and my dad might have not been worried at all. He might not have felt this way at all. It may have just been me. But you see, I thought we were in a bad situation. I thought we were going to lose it to this storm, that we were going to sink, that we were going to go under, that we would not survive the storm. Finally, we get to the boat ramp. We survived. We go to the restrooms only to come out, and I think that was for shelter, But then only to come out probably three minutes later, and what do we see? We see blue sky, and we see people out windsurfing, water skiing, and tubing. You see, this storm, this terrible storm in our eyes was over just as fast as it had started. This storm also may have seemed so much more severe to us because of because of the, the simple fact that we were not as prepared for it in our small little boat. Here's the point of my story, though. As I thought about this story, I thought about how scary a storm may feel, how scary and hard life may feel. But when we are close to God, all these troubles seem small. The storm seem to lift, and the sun and blue skies come out again. In fact, as Christians, we know that without a doubt, no matter how dark the day is, we have hope and life to look forward to. 
and we have peace with the Father. You see, we have a life filled with joy in the presence of the Lord. During these storms of life and the blue skies alike, we need to constantly be in God's word for wisdom. Proverbs 15, 29 gives us some good wisdom for today. And I forgot to change my slide for you, but it says this, Proverbs 15, 29. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayers of the righteous. The main idea for today is this. You can only pray to God through Jesus Christ. You can only pray to God through Jesus Christ. And to some of you, this is hard to hear because we want to pray with everybody. We want to pray for everybody. We want everybody to pray. I'd like to remind you today, more on, this, more on that later, I'd like to remind you today that we are in the Proverbs for the summer, and we are speaking about God's wisdom for living, everyday living. And we find words right here for living, words of wisdom. These are words of wisdom passed down from King Solomon to his son and from God to us. You see, too often we give in to fears. We give in to worries, to anxieties from day to day. And what we should be doing is devoting ourselves to prayer and time in God's word. We should be connecting with him. We should be close to him. We should be near to him, not far. You see, prayer connects us to the only one who can truly help us, to the one who has all the wisdom and power. And through Jesus Christ, we can pray to our Heavenly Father. He takes our focus off the storm and focuses us, focuses us on the sun. The sun, the beautiful, the radiant, the powerful, the bright sun, a Savior, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. You see what I did there? The Son of God, Jesus Christ, takes the storm away like the beautiful sun in the sky shines through the clouds. Jesus Christ shines through our troubles in life and helps to focus us on what matters. We do not need to worry when we submit to God, when we follow him, when we trust in him. He will lead us, he will hear us, he will guide us and provide for us. He will answer our prayers for he will hear our prayers. But this is not true for all people. Let me read this to you again. Proverbs 15, 29 states that the Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayers of the righteous. God is both far and near. That's the title of today's sermon, God far and near. God far and near. God is both far and near. And this proverb today helps to point out that there is a right way to pray to God and to be heard And this is by living righteously according to his words and through Jesus Christ. So who can pray to God? That's a natural question for all of us. And according to this scripture today, only the righteous can. The righteous, through Jesus, we we can pray. Excuse me, I should take a drink of water. Truly, anyone can pray to the Lord. But without Jesus Christ, without the righteousness of him, without confession, without repentance, it is possible that God gives you the silent treatment. In fact, it's scripturally based, it's biblical. It's not that God does not audibly hear you or hear it or hear the wicked. God hears the words of all for he is all powerful, all knowing and ever present. But he does not hear in a way to respond to all prayers. Let's move forward with point number one here. God is both far and near. Point one, God is not far from the wicked in a local sense. God is not far from the wicked in a local sense. You see, the wicked man upon the face of the earth lives and moves, although by his own selfish desires... He is always in the presence of the Lord. He is never far from God. He is simply and tragically ignoring God's presence, God's plan, God's will. You see, the wicked lives near to God in a local sense, for God is always near to us. 
And that's in Acts 17, 27. God is always near to us. But I'd like to read this whole scripture to you from Acts 17, 22 to 30, which says this, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you're very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. They were trying to worship anything and everything, even the unknown God, for they wanted to try to be right in the eyes of any and all gods. But there's only one true God. And he continues here, What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath in everything. You see, our God is in everything, for he gave breath to everything. He created all things, but it goes on. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. But listen closely to verse 27 as it relates to my point here, that is, God is not far from the wicked in a local sense. That they should seek God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him. He is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Let me continue to read here. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. Verse 30, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. You see, God is also near the wicked in a local sense in that he is near to them as they each will be personally judged for the ignorance and continued sinful actions. God is also near to the wicked in a local sense how he is always present and awaiting their repentance. But without repentance and total submission to him, The wicked shall perish into everlasting torment. These are the so-called wicked who are far from God. Point two, God is far from the wicked in a moral sense. God is local to, God is near them in a local sense, but God is far from them in a moral sense or in one sense. You see, there is often a wide moral distance between those who are locally near to one another. Just because you're in the presence of a person doesn't mean you're really paying attention to that person, doesn't mean you're hearing that person, doesn't mean you're helping that person. For instance, one illustration I found says, the father who lives and toils for his children and eats with them at the same dinner table may be as far from them morally as he is nearer to them locally. Proverbs 15, 29 speaks of the Lord being far from the wicked. And the reasoning for the, the distance is their wickedness, their ungodliness, their sinfulness, them cherishing selfish desires over the ways of God, their lack of confession and dependence upon him. God has one view of life, and the wicked ungodly have another. They do not listen to God, and therefore God does not listen to them. Without the righteousness of Christ and following him, the wicked are forever far from God, and are not heard or answered unless it goes along with God's already ordained will and plan. They must yield to God or be forever far and apart from him. To start to summarize these two points and to move on about the wicked and move forward to the righteous, I want to say this. You see, God is near locally as God is never far off from the sinner's cries of repentance He is also near in the way that judgment will come to him. But he is far from hearing and helping the wicked. Without the righteousness of Christ, one could not be further from peace, from hope, and from help. 
The Lord is not with the wicked in a crisis as he is with the righteous. Isaiah 59, 2 says that their iniquity separates them from God and their sins hide his face from them so that he does not listen. The wicked man is the only one to blame for the farness of God here. His continued sin, his continued wickedness, but Christ's righteousness is the answer. The wicked must choose to confess with his mouth that Jesus is Lord and follow after him. He must choose to obey God's ways. He must choose closeness and oneness with the Lord and Christ's righteousness. God invites men to make this choice, but he must make the choice. Isaiah 55, 7 says, Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon them. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30 furthermore says, Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Romans ten thirteen says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And finally, in Ezekiel 33, 11, he says that he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but desires that the wicked turn from his evil ways and live. God is far from the wicked, yet always close. Sinful living, selfish living, desires, these things separate you from God. These things keep you far. But let me remind you that this is all of us. We are all wicked. We are all sinners. We are all unrighteous. We all seek out our own selfish desires. When you continue to give in to these things, you can feel further and further and further from the love and righteousness of God. But he is still there. We need to submit to him, confess to him, and be close through the righteousness of Christ. The wicked man must either turn to God or be forever apart from him. Moving forward with point three, God is near to the righteous. God hears the prayers of the righteous, Proverbs 15, 29. There is sympathy between God and the righteous man. God hears the prayers of the righteous man. In fact, he takes pleasure and joy in listening to the prayers of the righteous and to his followers. The righteous and godly man seeks to know God through total submission to him and living according to his righteous ways through Jesus. We can commune with God in prayer. Is this you, though? As you hear that definition I just gave you, the righteous and godly man is a man who seeks to know God through total submission to him and living according to his righteous ways through Jesus. We can commune with God in prayer. Is this you? Are you righteous through Christ? Are you wicked? Are you a bit of both? I mean, ponder these thoughts. I think really we all are a bit of both. But God sees us as righteous through Christ's blood when we submit and confess to him. Are you submitting to him and his ways? Are you trying? Are you confessing and repenting? Or are you trying to do things on your own, by your own power, by your own ways or the worldly ways? Every day we have a choice. How will we live? Through Jesus, we have an intimate and personal relationship to the Father in heaven. He gives you his ear and he listens to our prayers. He saves and he gives freely of his divine wisdom, strength, and presence. God hears our prayers before we even speak them because he knows you intimately and sees into your souls and the desires of your heart. Long before you've even thought of these prayers or expressed these desires, God hears the prayers of the righteous before they even open their mouth to pray. Just as God is near to the righteous man hearing his prayers, the righteous man should always be seeking to be nearer to God and opening his ears to hear him. God is both far and near. God is near and far to the sinner, the wicked, the ungodly. God is also near to hear his righteous children. Are you following him? Is he hearing you? Would you like someone to talk to this morning? I encourage you to come talk to me. 
Talk to a neighbor, talk to a deacon. Come up here and pray with me this morning and let's pray to God together. Let's repent, let's confess of our need for him. Let's talk. As we work to close, there's one additional thought to mention or question to answer. How should one pray to God? How does one prosper? And to this I say we must humbly confess. Proverbs 28, 13 says, Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Guys, I understand it's hard to confess, especially to confess openly, to confess in front of your brothers, your sisters, your family, your loved ones, your friends. Sometimes it's easier to confess to a stranger. Sometimes it's easier to confess to a pastor. But we need to most importantly confess to God. And then, yes, you should confess to your brothers, your sisters, your family, your parents, your friends. Allow them to help to keep you accountable. Allow them to pour into and encourage you and convict you and help you to help you grow. God intends to use the people that he's put in your lives to help you. Find God's ear through Jesus today. Prosper and obtain mercy through Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior over your life as you confess and repent and humbly come before God. According to God's word, Christ is a mediator to the Father on our behalf. God hears us through him and his righteousness. David Platt once said, If you want to be heard by the king of the universe, then come humbly as a sinner and plead the mercy of Christ. Have you done this? Have you come humbly as a sinner and pleaded for the mercy of Christ to cover your sins to be heard by the king of the universe? Have you asked for forgiveness? Let's do it today. Let's pray together today. Let's talk to God and be heard. I close with this thought. You can only pray and be heard by God through Jesus Christ. Humbly come before him, confess and repent. You see, prayer is a privilege. It is a great blessing and one which we earn, but not based off our own works. It is by the grace of God and the work of Christ and his mercy. Let's close in prayer now.